This is a story called The Christmas Day Truce of 1914. It's a letter from a British soldier to his sister. Well, dear Sister Janet, it's two o'clock in the morning and most of our men are asleep in their dugouts, yet I could not sleep myself before writing you of the wonderful events of Christmas Eve. In truth, what happened seemed almost like a fairy tale, and if I hadn't been through it myself, I would have scarcely believed it. While you and the family sang carols before the fire there in London, I did the same with enemy soldiers here on the battlefields of France. As I wrote before, there's been a little serious fighting of late. The first battles of the war left so many dead that both sides have had held back until replacements could come from home. So, we've mostly stayed in our trenches and waited. But what a terrible waiting it's been. Knowing that at any moment, an artillery shell might land and explode beside us in the trench killing or maiming several of us, and in daylight not daring to lift our heads above ground for fear of a sniper's bullet. And the rain, the rain's fallen almost daily, dear sister. Of course, it collects right here in our trenches where we must bail it out with pots and pans. And with the rain has come mud, a good foot or more deep of mud. It splatters and cakes everything, our weapons, our clothing, and it constantly sucks at our boots. One new recruit got his feet stuck in it, and then his hands too when he tried to get out. Through all this, we couldn't help feeling curious about the German soldiers across the way. After all, they faced the same dangers we did and slogged about in the same muck. What's more, their first trench was only 50 yards from our own. Between us, lay no man's land, bordered on both sides with barbed wire. Yet they were close enough we sometimes heard their voices. Of course, we hated them when they killed one of our friends. But other times, we joked about them and almost felt we had something in common. Then, just yesterday morning, Christmas Eve day, we had our first good freeze. Gold as we were, we welcomed it, because at least the mud froze solid. Everything was tinged white with frost, while a bright sun shone over all. Perfect Christmas weather. During the day, there was little shelling or rifle fire from either side, and as darkness fell on our Christmas Eve, the shooting stopped entirely. Our first complete silence in months. We hoped it might promise a peaceful holiday, but we didn't count on it. We'd been told the Germans might attack and try to catch us off guard. I went to the dugout to rest, and lying on my cot, I must have just drifted asleep. At once, my friend John was shaking me awake, saying, Come and see. Come and see, see what the Germans are doing. I grabbed my rifle, stumbled onto the out into the trench and stuck my head curiously above the sandbags. Dear sister, I never hoped to see a stranger and more lovely sight. Clusters of tiny lights were shining all along the German line, left and right as far as the eye could see. What is it? I asked in bewilderment. John answered, Christmas trees. And so it was. The Germans had placed Christmas trees in front of their trenches, lit by candle lantern, like beacons of goodwill. And then we heard their voices raised in song. Silent locked, silent locked. This girl may not yet be familiar to you in Britain, dear sister, but John knew it and translated it. Silent night, holy night. I've never heard one lovelier or more meaningful in that quiet, clear night. It's dark, softened by a first quarter moon. When the song finished, the men in our trenches applauded. Yes. 
British soldiers applauding Germans. Then one of our men started singing, and we all joined in. The first Noel, the angel did say. In truth, we sounded not nearly as good as the Germans, but with their fine harp, with all of their fine harmonies. In truth, we sounded not nearly as good as the Germans with their fine harmonies. But they responded with enthusiastic applause of their own, and then began another. O oh, Tonnenbaum, O oh, Tonnenbaum. Then we replied, O oh, come, all ye faithful. But this time, they joined in, singing the words in Latin, Adelis Fidelis. British and Germans harmonizing across no man's land. I would not have thought, I would have thought nothing could be more amazing. But when, but, but what came next was even more so. English, come over. We heard one of them shout. You no shoot, we no shoot. There in the trenches, we looked at each other in bewilderment. Then one of us shouted jokingly, You come over here! To our astonishment, we saw two figures rise from the trench, climb over the barbed wire, and advance unprotected across no man's land. One of them called, Send officer to talk. I saw one of our men lift his rifle to the ready. I know about others did the same, but our captain yelled out, Hold your fire! Then he climbed out and he went to meet the Germans. We heard them talking. And a few minutes later, the captain came back with a German cigar in his mouth. We agreed there'll be no shipping before midnight tomorrow, he announced. But sentries stay on duty. The rest of you, stay alert. Across the way, we could make out groups of two or three men stand, starting out of their trenches and coming towards us. Then some of us, some of us started climbing out of our trenches too, and in minutes more, dear sister, there we were in no man's land, over a hundred soldiers and officers of each side shaking hands with men we'd been trying to kill just hours earlier. Before long, a bonfire was built, and around it we mingled, British, khaki, and German gray, I must say. The Germans were the better dressed, with fresh uniforms for the holiday. Only a couple of our men knew German, but a curious thing, sister, the more, more of the Germans knew English. I asked one of them why that was. Because many have worked in England, he said. Before all of this, I was a waiter at the Hotel Cecil. Perhaps I waited on your table. Perhaps you did, I said, laughing. He told me he had a girlfriend in London and, he, and, and that the ward interrupted their plans for marriage. I told him, don't worry, we'll have you beat by Easter, then you can come back and marry that girl. He laughed at that. Then he asked if I'd send her a postcard that he'd give me later. Of course I would, I promised him. Another German had been a porter at Victoria Station. He showed me a picture of his family back in Munich. His elder sister was so lovely. I said I should like to meet her someday. He beamed and said he would like that very much and gave me his family's address. Even those who could not converse still could exchange gifts. Our cigarettes for their cigars, our tea for their coffee, our corned beef for their sausage. Badges and buttons from uniforms changed owners, and one of our lads walked off with the infamous spiked helmet. I myself traded a jackknife for a leather equipment belt, a fine souvenir to show when I get home. Newspapers, too, changed hands, and the Germans howled with laughter at ours. They assured us that France was finished and Russia nearly beaten, too. We told them... But that was nonsense. And one of them said, Well, you believe your newspapers, and we will believe ours. Clearly they are lied to, dear sister, yet after meeting these men, I wonder how truthful our own newspapers have been. 
They're not, they're not the savage barbarians we've read so much about, dear sister. These are men with homes and families, hopes and fears, principles, and yes, love of country. In other words, men like ourselves. Why are we led to believe otherwise? As it grew late, a few more songs were traded around the fire, and then all joined in. I'm not lying to you, sister, for auld lang syne. Then we parted with promises to meet again tomorrow, and even some talk of a football match. I was starting back to my trenches when an older German soldier clutched my arm. He said, my God, why could not we have peace and all go home? I told him gently, for that you must ask your emperor. He looked at me searchingly and said, perhaps, but also we must ask our hearts. And so, dear sister, tell me, has there ever been such a Christmas Eve in all of history? What does it all mean? This impossible befriending of enemies. For the fighting here, of course, it means we're to be little. Decent fellows these soldiers may be, but they follow orders and we do the same. Besides, we're here to stop their army and send it home. And never could we shirk from that duty. Still, one cannot help imagine what would happen if the spirit shown here were caught by the nations of the world. Of course, disputes must always arise. But what if our leaders were to offer well wishes in place of warnings, songs in place of slurs, presents in place of reprisals? Would not our war end at once? All nations say they want peace. Yet on this Christmas morning, I wonder if we want it quite enough. Your loving brother, Tom.